Faith and Victory Church. Uh, as we continue in our uh, series, uh, The Bible in the Light of Our Redemption by E.W. Kenyon, his basic Bible course. Uh, once again, we do encourage you to purchase this uh, study guide and um, have it with you. And even if you started with us now, starting late, uh, it would it would be uh, well worth it to have it in your library and to go back and um, study uh, what you've missed. Praise the Lord. Uh, we're going to we're going to jump right on in tonight. Um, praise the Lord. And um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to mute my phone here so it doesn't make all that noise. Praise the Lord. All right. Uh, tonight's lesson is the offering. You know, we, we're in, we've gotten into the tabernacle and uh, like start talking about the priesthood. Now we're talking about the offerings um, that were in the temple. And um, let's start out first of all as we go here with the priest's garments. Uh, and as we said, everything to do with the priesthood and so forth is symbolic and uh, demonstrates a symbolism and typology of, of the coming Christ and his uh, meteoric work in our behalf. Uh, the um, priest's garments we find in Exodus 39 um, and chapters 28. We find information on that. Um, there was a part of the priest's uh, garments called the uh, coat. Uh, really probably more pro uh, um, properly referred to as a tunic. It, it derives from the verb meaning to cover or to hide. To cover or to hide. So the priest wore an outer uh, a coat called a tunic. Um, these outer garments were distinctive of a representative character. Um, they bore the name of Israel before the Lord. Um, the pomegranates around the hem of the robe uh, related to the fact that, um, to that the people as bearing fruit to God. So we have another type of algae that you know, they were to bear fruit to God. And the under tunic, tunic sorry, um, had no connection with the people in symbolism. It was rather a personal clothing of the high priest. Um, in other words, he had to be pure. In order to offer sins for the people, he had to be pure. Okay? Um, and or atoned for. Um, covered. What atoning and atone means to cover. Um, used in the New Testament, you know, Jesus was made for us uh, 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 um, as in the atonement. Not a good translation in the King James in the New Testament because we're not atoned for, we're not just covered, we are actually cleansed and made righteous. Um, so, um, then the fine, the fine white linen coat was typical of the righteousness with which he was covered. So the uh, priest who offered the sins for the people had to be righteous. Okay, Again, um, pure white linen, righteous. Um, the cup, you know, he was, he was, so somebody, the, the one who would offer the sins for the people had to them, themselves be righteous. Again, referring to Christ. Hallelujah. Uh, because, you know, he was the lamb without spot or blemish. Uh, when you say the offering itself, the lamb had to be a, a um, lamb without blemish. It had to be spotless. And therefore, um, we find that Jesus had to be spotless. Hallelujah. The girdle that the priest wore, um, the, its object or its purpose was to strengthen the loins for service. In the earthly ministry of Jesus, Jesus girded himself with zeal to do the Father's will that all the forces of hell and of men could not shake. No matter how hard Satan tried to destroy Jesus, he couldn't. No matter what men did to Jesus, they couldn't. Until he said, I lay my life down and I take up again. Um, 
they, Satan tried to drown him in the sea. Um, he calmed the storm. He walked on the water in the midst of the storm. Um, they took him out to the edge of the city to throw him off a cliff, and he passed through the midst. It wasn't until he declared to, to Peter and the disciples that he lays his life down and he takes it up again. When they came to take him in the garden, he allowed them to take him. Uh, in other words, he was strengthened for the journey. He had strength for his ministry, for his ministry and for his mission, and they could not stop him or shake him. Praise God. So, you know, the priest's covering were important. How he was covered was important. Um, what he was doing was important. And let's talk about the offerings themselves. There were two um, distinct offerings or types of offerings um, that uh, we have here. One includes the offering, uh, one type can. Uh, included the offering connected with the great day of atonement. And Kenya refers to them, um, you know, maybe a little bit different fellowship offerings and non-fellowship offerings. Um, theologically, you'll see a lot of times people refer to them as voluntary and involuntary. Okay? Um, so if you're studying or you see what's referred to here tonight, you don't hear the term voluntary and involuntary. You've heard that before. Um, or vice versa. Those are, those are terms you will hear um, in discussion of the offerings. Um, so um, we have the ones that are con connected to the Day of Atonement. And then the other ones, the first three, um, are given in Leviticus 1 through 4. And the other two are given in Leviticus 4 through 7. Now, the first three offerings were what we refer to in Kenya calls for fellowship. Um, in most theological circles, you hear it referred to as voluntary um, offerings. And so we had the voluntary or fellowship offerings. And um, I like I like his terminology. Don't take me wrong. I just want you to um, know that if you're hearing someone teach on it, and they, uh, someone else teach on this, or you hear that term voluntary offering or involuntary um, what's what's what, what they're talking about? We're not talking about two different things. We're still talking about the two uh, sets of offerings. Um, the first, so the first three offerings are fellowship offerings or voluntary. In other words, because we want to, you don't, they were not required. You did not have to offer the fellowship offerings. Okay. Now. We know the reason for creation uh, and the heart cry of the Father. Remember, uh, Kenyon also has a book, The Father and His Family, and uh, which he, he, he lays out the case of the Father heart of God for a family, the lo Father's loving heart and desire for a family. And um, so his, his reason for creation was the the very father heart of God desired and yearned for fellowship. And um, when the spiritual death entered into the spirit of man, it separated man from God and broke that fellowship and, and um, deprived the father heart of God of that fellowship, which Satan rejoiced in because of his hatred for God. Um, uh, and we see this uh, again, his, his desire for fellowship, um, when he requests a, a spiritual did Israel to build a tabernacle so he can just kind of come down and hang out in the middle of it. He can't be with them. But he can be in the camp near them. Um, my. And, um, and he even makes, a, he begins to make provision for them to come as close as they can through the sacrificial system and the priesthood and the offerings. And um, for their, and, and this is referred to as Aaronic priesthood and offerings. Now remember, Jesus was not after the order of Aaron. Jesus was after the order of Melchizedek. Hallelujah. Um, so of the five offerings, the first three 
were fellowship offerings, or even as Kenny goes on further, says worship offerings. And the last two were for broken fellowship, involuntary, or we also call them sin offerings. Sin and trespass offerings. <coughs> either way, the object was either for fellowship or to restore fellowship with God. So let's look at the first one, the whole burnt offering, which we find in Leviticus chapter 6, verses 8 through 13, uh, was a purely fellowship offering. It was a love offering, uh, offered by the free will of the individual um, at the door of the tent of meeting. Um, man laid his hand upon the head of the offering, thus identifying himself with the offering, which would make an atonement for him. Spiritually dead Israel could not fellowship without God, but first a cover being provided for him. The man brings his offering, slays it, cuts it to pieces. The priest sprinkles the blood around the brazen altar. He's able to do this upon the basis of the great day of atonement. The high priest did not have a part in the love offering, only the priest. The inner feet and feet are washed. The feet are touched because they touched the cursed ground. They had to be washed. The innards have been filled with the fruit of the cursed ground. There was a threefold judgment that passed on the offering. The man who ordered it examined it to discover whether or not it was without blemish. The priest examined it and God examined it. In this uh, respect, a type of Christ. They could find no fault in him. They had to make false charges to Jesus. Um, God could find a fault in the offering of Jesus. He cried on several occasions, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. Jesus found his fault with himself. He said, the prince of this world cometh and he hath nothing in me. Hallelujah. He also said, which of you convict me of, convict me of sin? And um, three scriptures show the sinless, sinlessness of Jesus in his own eyes as well the eyes of God and the people. Leviticus 1.9 The offering was burnt upon the altar for a sweet smell upon unto Jehovah. It was a sweet savor fellowship between God and man. Ephesians 5.2 tells, tells us that the sacrifice was of Christ was an odor of sweet smell before God. This was possible but because it restored righteousness to man and brought him back to God. It made fellowship between, uh, between God and man possible. Isaiah 53.10 says that yet it pleased, Jeho it pleased God or Jehovah to bruise him. So precious was the man in the sight of God that it pleased him to suffer and a son to suffer that man might be given again the right of sonship. Hallelujah. And so this, this love offering or burnt offering was brought in fellowship with God. Hallelujah. Leviticus 2 talks about the meal offering. Um, also a free will, voluntary fellowship offering. Expression of love toward the covenant, God. The worshiper is to bring a basin of fine meal. And everything coarse and unseemly uh, was taken out. The fine flour is a beautiful type of the perfect humanity of Christ and his body, the church. Oil was poured over. Uh, this is the type of the Holy Spirit's anointing uh, on the church and Jesus. It was soaked in oil. And the Aaron Bible says this, that he gave Christ, the uh, Jesus, the spirit without measure. Hallelujah. He didn't withhold anything. Frankincense was put upon it. Worshiper then brought the meal offering to the priest. Again, the high priest, high priest is not seen here. And who took a handful of the meal uh, with all the frankincense and burned it upon the altar. An offering made by fire, a sweet savor unto Jehovah. And the frankincense is typical of worship. Therefore, all of it uh, was burned upon the altar 
offering toward, toward Jehovah, he received he received all the worship, love, and adoration. No one else got it. All the frankincense was burned to Jehovah because God gets all the glory. I'm Lord. I, I, I share my glory with no man. Um, the meal offering is a type of Christ in the Gospel of Luke. Here we see the beautiful humanity of Jesus. The incarnation is the fine meal mingled with oil. There was much salt in the life of Christ, meaning his wonderful wisdom and all of his conversation or lifestyle. There was no honey, typical of self-indulgence in man. There was no leaven, never a false note. He never accommodated himself to the ignorance of the people. He is always the true spokesman from God. He gave all the frankincense to the Father. The Father had all the glory. It took uh, fire to bring the fragrance out of the frank frankincense. It took the cross to reveal the fragrance and beauty of Jesus. What was left was to be eaten by the priest in the holy place. This meal is a type of our feeding upon the word. Praise the Lord. Can you all say amen out there? And then the peace offering we also find now in Leviticus 3. In the peace offering, we see the gracious provision that God made for man's fellowship with him. The peace offering is a different type of fellowship. In the meal offering, God had his portion. And the priest and his family have their portion. In the peace offering, the worshiper also has his portion. Jehovah has all the fat of the animal. Then the priest and his family and the worshiper with his family both have their share. Here we have a type of fellowship. Inside the outer court sat the priest and his family and the worshiper and his family. Eating while Jehovah receives his share. And eating is a type of the higher order of fellowship. We, all, we always joke around and say, um, when Christians say, uh, let's, have, let's go have some fellowship. We, we, we really mean, where, where do you want to go eat? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'll go to Dario's. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, let's, let's, have some, let's get together and have some fellowship. And uh, where we want, what means, what, what do you want to eat? Let's go meet somewhere. Hallelujah. I didn't get a laugh out there once. Nobody scrolled. Come on, guys. Praise the Lord. Um, you cannot eat and enjoy the fellowship, the food, his food, your food, in the presence of the enemy. Hallelujah. Without being uh, in relationship and fellowship with God. Hallelujah. The Bible says he prepared the table for me in the presence of my enemies. In other words, before them, because we're in his place. We're with him. Even in the midst of that, when we're in fellowship with God, we can sit in the midst of the enemy and have fellowship with God. Hallelujah. You cannot do that outside of your fellowship with God. Hallelujah. Um, Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. In this passage, eating is used as a type to show forth the fellowship between the Father and Christ with man as they make their home with him. The worship of Israel had to be upon the level of the physical senses. Their fellowship also had to be upon the same level. They could have fellowship only as man desired to express his thanksgiving towards his covenant God. Those who were ungrateful probably brought no fellowship offerings. We see from scripture that God was not a despot. A despot. despot uh, a ruler who expresses himself um, or exp exercises his authority in a cruel and oppressive way. God's not, it's not God. 
Um, before he had given to Israel the law of the covenant, he reviews Moses. He reviews before Moses his faithfulness to the covenant and delivering them from Egypt and caring for them in their three months journey. He then gave them the permission of choosing whether or not they would walk with him as a covenant people. <laughs> Something they blew a few times here and there. Um, before the law of the covenant really went into effect, the people first ratified it. God gave the law orally to Moses, who gave it to the people, who said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and be obedient. In the building of the tabernacle, it was this was so. It was made of offerings and willing hearts. Likewise, in the fellowship offerings, they were to come from those who were willing to worship the Lord. The fellowship and the peace offering was threefold fellowship between God, the priest, and man. It is a type of our fellowship today. We have fellowship with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, and we have fellowship one with another. Amen? We have fellowship with the Father. We have fellowship with the high priest, Jesus Christ. And we have fellowship one with another. Praise the Lord. Um, those were voluntary. They were not required. Didn't have to do it. Um, the last two are what we refer to as, uh, King, again, Kenya calls it broken fellowship, but they're also involuntary offerings. And there are the sin and, uh, and trespassing offerings. For the purpose of restoring fellowship. You know, I mean, you know, not not um, because God's ticked off with you that you sin, but to restore the fellowship. And these are found in Leviticus chapters 5 and chapter 6. So they're... they're um, object of the sin offering and the trespass offering was to maintain fellowship in other words maintaining by restoring um, the sin offering was offered when a, a, a priest an anointed priest ruler or anyone of the common people has directly sinned against Jehovah um Leviticus 6, 1 and 2 is a, a cheating, is cheating a neighbor over some des deposit or pledge or thief or taking advantage of the neighbor in regard to lost property or false oath. Um, the trespass offering was directly against your own neighbor. And as we mentioned before, it's possible to have the, these five offerings to be accepted because of the foundation was laid in the atonement made once a year. Hallelujah. So the sin offerings, when you sin directly against God, the trespass offering is when you sin against your neighbor. So they're both dealing with sin, but one was a directed at God. In other words, you, um, you violated his word directly. You sin against God. When you sin against your neighbor, that was a trespass offering because you trespassed against your neighbor. Okay. Praise praise the Lord. Uh, when we talk about the sin of Nadab and uh, Abihu, um, Israel was spiritually dead and needed an atonement, as revealed in Leviticus ten one. And we talked about this about bringing strange fire. We talked about when I preached the sermon on uh, the God who answers by fire. I talked. We talked about the strange fire of um, Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's sons. The covenant God desired fellowship with his people, but because of their condition of spiritual death, they could approach him only through a divinely appointed way. Spiritually dead man needed a mediator. The blessing of the Lord might have been mightily upon the temple and the dedication of the priesthood and the glory of the Lord appeared to the people in Leviticus chapters 8 and 9. And then a tragedy befalls the family of Aaron his two sons who dared to approach Jehovah uninvited and in their own way, and King James and other translations were it, they brought strange fire um, before the Lord. 
are smitten by a fire that devours them. And Israel learns they cannot approach God in their own way. Okay? And so, when we look at that, we have to, we have to realize that, again, symbolism and typology is, is in play and in place. Because uh, had God allowed that to go unchallenged, uh, people would have continued to try to come their own way. Even today they do that. You know, well, I believe I, that um, I can bring this before God. This started with, with um, Caleb. Not Caleb. Cain. Cain and Abel. Abel brought the, the blood sacrifice that God required. Cain brought the, the fruits of his ground. And God had respect to Aaron's, I mean, um, Abel's offering and not to Cain's. Abel, Cain was wroth and killed Abel. Because Abel did it God's way, and Cain wanted to do it his way, and God wasn't satisfied with his way. God could not let that typology stand. When Moses smote the rock in the wilderness twice, and then remember Jesus is the rock where the living water came from, he couldn't allow that symbolism to stand because striking it twice meant Christ would have had been killed more than once, and he was only to die once he appeared in the end. Therefore, Moses had to be punished because of it. Uh, so the typology would be straight. And the typology would be clear. Um, and so we can only approach God on his terms and in his way. But God's terms and way are to restore us and to bring us into and to have us in fellowship. Um, let's look at our questions tonight. And um, I apologize, my voice is a little weak uh, tonight. And um, thank God I'm getting through this. Hallelujah. Uh, how did the coat of the high priest reveal a need for atonement? And the coat, more properly, a tunic, uh, what came from the word, a verb, to mean to cover or to hide. So the high priest himself had to be covered or hid. We had to have a, he had to have a covering. Now Jesus, why? Because he represented Jesus. So in typology, he had to be complete, completely covered in righteousness and purity to go before the Father on our behalf, just as Jesus did. Was tempted in, in every point yet as we are, yet without sin. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Can you say amen out there? Is there anybody there? Anybody home? Hallelujah. All right. In what respect was the girdle a type of Christ? Well, um, thank you. Right, there you go. There goes some happies. The object of the girdle was to strengthen the loins for service. In the earthly ministry of Jesus, he girded himself with the zeal to do the Father's will. And all the forces of man and hell could not shake him. Aren't we glad? Aren't we glad that he, he walked right through the power of the enemy and through the hands of men, unscathed and untouched, until he laid his life down and then he took it up again. Um, name the five fellowship uh, fellowship offerings. So uh, I like what King is doing because he's, he's bringing all these offerings into fellowship with God. Okay, and again, we said that um, um, in theological circles, you will hear these referred to as voluntary and involuntary offerings. Hallelujah. And um, the, the fellowship offerings are the voluntary offerings with the burnt, the meal, and the peace offering. The burnt offering is also called the love offering. And you will hear it referred that way. Um, hallelujah. They were voluntary. They were not required. They were simply because the... Um, the person wanted to come and to worship God and to honor God and to have fellowship with God with these offerings. So they're completely voluntary. Hallelujah. And then the broken fellowship or the involuntary or the sin offerings. Um, either one of those terms you will hear in reference to the sin and the trespass offerings. Again, the sin offering was for acts committed directly against God the trespass was against your neighbor. 
Okay? Um, and that's that simple. Praise the Lord. And they were for the purpose of restoring fellowship. They weren't for the they weren't for the purpose of acknowledging that you had sinned. They were the purpose of restoring you from the sin. Amen. And so even when we repent, and we can debate First John one nine or whether you need to repent or not, from now until Jesus comes back, um, being restored in the fellowship with the Father is important. Whatever terminology you want to use. Okay, we we you you um, it is an acknowledgement. The sin offering was an acknowledgement of the sin, but of the desire to be restored to fellowship. Okay, um, I'm not going to debate semantics over you with with some people and, and whatever. The fact is, uh, if you've sinned, you broke your fellowship. May not, may not have lost your salvation. Um, I grew up classical Pentecostal, which tends to be Arminius in, in, the, in theological theory, meaning that if you sinned and Jesus came back before you repented, you went to hell. Uh, I don't believe that. Neither do I believe once saved, I always say that no matter what you do, you're going to heaven after you get saved. It just don't matter. You just can't do anything to get unsaved. Um, a Calvinist. Um, I like to tell people I'm a Calvinist. Uh, I'm somewhere in the middle of that. Hallelujah, which is probably where most people really are. Hallelujah. And I know all my faith and victory church peeps um, have been well taught in that area. Um, how was the threefold judgment that was passed upon the whole burnt offering a type of Christ? Well, the man who ordered the offering, or examined the offering, the priest examined it, and God examined it. God, uh, Christ was examined by the law, the priesthood, and God, and in all three cases, found faultless. Hallelujah. How did the meal offering portray Christ? Because we see Luke, this gospel shows us the humanity of Jesus. The incarnation is the fine meal mingled with oil, and there was much salt in the life of Christ. Thus, uh, this means his wonderful wisdom and all of his conversation, lifestyle. There was no honey, um, typical of self-indulgence in man. There was no leaven. It was never a false note. He never accommodated himself to the ignorance of the people. He is always a true spokesman. He gave all the frankincense. Remember, that's the worship to the Father. The Father had all the glory. Jesus, all the, Father, the works that I do, the Father in me, he doeth the works. I only do those things which I see my father do. Hallelujah. Now the, the peace offering provide a means of fellowship. Uh, inside the outer courts, out the priest and his family, and the worshiper and his family. Uh, and they were eating. Jehovah received his share. Eating is a type of the higher order of fellowship. Remember, remember, remember we said, when Christians say, let's go have some fellowship, they're asking you what restaurant you want to go to. Hallelujah. What was the object of the sin offering? It was to maintain fellowship with God. And what was the object of the trespass offering? To maintain fellowship with man. Because we had to we needed to be restored people that we had trespassed against, or when somebody trespassed against you, they need you know the trespass offering restored that fellowship. And what was the sin of Nadab and Abihu? They dared to approach Jehovah uninvited and then in their own way. As we've said in the past, um, the King James at least refers to it as they brought strange fire before the Lord. In other words, they offered something before the Lord that was saying what I have is good enough for what you demand. Making Man equal with God in the sense that God must accept what he brings because it's good enough. And God demanded a specific thing the way he said it had to be done. Hallelujah. Uh, next week we get into the Day of Atonement. Glory to God. And um, 
these are exciting times we're living in. We're coming up on uh, Christmas. Um, I said next week. It will not be next week. I'm sorry. Uh, so next week, the following week. Um, it's going to be three weeks before we rejoin you with Wednesday night Bible study. Next two weeks is the Christmas break. And uh, we're, we're out. Uh, so no prayer next two weeks. No Bible study next two weeks. Uh, no Sunday service on the 26th. So um, we will join you with Lesson 16 on January um, the 6th. January the 6th, we return. So make a note of that. We return on January the 6th for Wednesday night Bible study. Praise the Lord. Um, join us this Sunday at New Life Family Church at 1 o'clock. And uh, our last service before Christmas. We'd love to see you before um, there. And, um, and and get the, get the love on you and tell you how much we appreciate you. Uh, but until we see you again, remember these words in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. That whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We love you. God bless you. And you have a wonderful evening in Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen and good night.